When the conservatives, the common sense conservatives, want to build homes, cut taxes, fix the budget, and stop crime, the prime minister is not worth the cost. After eight years of inflation and about inflation, we have a pyromaniac who is fanning the flames of inflationary fires with oil instead of water we want to bring. Can the Prime Minister recognize, with all of this billions in spending, it's getting hot and expensive for taxpayers? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Conservatives, if they want to talk about the economy, I will be happy to do so. With two million Canadians more, uh, we've lifted 3 million Canadians out of poverty since we came to power, and we will continue to invest in Canadians rather than cutting programs such as uh, what the Conservatives would do. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition, the Conservatives uh, want to fix the budget to reduce inflation and interest rates, but the Prime Minister is not worth the cost. Mortgages, according to the lead economist of Scotiabank, Inflationary deficits from this Prime Minister are driving up interest rates by 2 percent and preventing the Bank of Canada from reducing them. Canadians may lose their homes because of these big announcements with billions of dollars in inflationary spending. Can the Prime Minister recognize that his spending and mortgage rates are not worth the cost? Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We are going to invest in Canadians, and that is why we're going to help every generation to move forward by building more homes faster and by making life more affordable. This Conservative leader uh, is does not believe that everyone deserves a fair chance. We want to put uh, fairness First. Well, we do have a common sense conservative plan to axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, and stop the crime. While this prime minister is not worth the cost after eight years on inflation, with all his multi billion dollar announcements, he is like the pyromaniac pretending to be a fireman, except the hose is spraying gas on the inflationary fire rather than water. According to the Scotiabank's chief economist, these inflationary deficits are driving up mortgage payments. Doesn't he realize that all of his spending is putting the heat and the costs on our homeowners? The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This government has a plan for an affordable and prosperous future. We have a plan that is focused on ensuring that we are building more homes faster, making life more affordable, and growing an economy that works for all Canadians. The Conservative leader has no plan for affordability other than a bunch of taglines. He has no plan for, for addressing the environment. He has no plan for the economy. We believe in ensuring that Canadians have a fair chance to succeed, and we are acting on that. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, we, our plan is to axe the tax and cap the spending to bring down inflation and interest rates. Right, right we will have a carbon tax election, and people will choose whether they want to quadruple the, ca the tax to 61 cents with the NDP and the Prime Minister, or axe the tax under my common sense leadership. But in the meantime, people can't afford to eat. So will the Prime Minister show a little bit of compassion and accept my common sense demand to axe the tax on farmers and food? The Honourable Minister of Housing. Mr. Speaker, it is laughable when I hear the Conservative leader talk about affordability. He mentioned in a previous question some of the concerns he has around housing policy. His plan to build more homes is to cut investments in home building, is to raise taxes on those who are building homes, and when it comes to actually changing the way cities build homes, his deputy leader held a press conference to explicitly declare that Conservatives were siding with the NIMBYs when it comes to zoning reform. We are going to do what's necessary to put money on the table to build more affordable housing, create market conditions to get more homes built, and change the way that cities build homes so we can solve the housing crisis. Hey.
The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. He caused the housing crisis, right. Mr. Speaker. Under his role as housing minister, the amount of a paycheck necessary to make payments on an average mortgage has gone up to a record smashing 64 percent from 38 percent. And he is the only one, along with his prime minister, that wants to raise taxes on home building. A massive carbon tax on the building materials that go into assembling those homes. So, will the prime minister, instead of hiking the tax, except my common sense demand to axe the tax on farmers' food and houses at the same time. The Honourable Minister of Infrastructure and Housing. Uh, Mr. Speaker, it's interesting because he's actually put his plan on the record, and his plan includes putting the GST back on apartment construction for hundreds of thousands of middle class homes in this country. He has one of the worst records in the past decade of anyone when it comes to getting homes built when he had the position responsible for housing in Parliament. Mr. Speaker, while he was Minister, they built exactly zero new apartments, zero uh, cooperative units, and only six affordable housing units across the entire country. We are helping get hundreds of thousands of homes built in this country, and we will do what it takes to solve the crisis once and for all. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. After Pharmacare, Dental Care and MAID, you'd think we'd seen the last of federal interference in Quebec's jurisdiction? No. The Liberals have announced that they also want to tell Quebecers how to build housing. This is the same government that lost control of immigration, created a rive scam, which is unable to pay its own employees through Phoenix, that created a monumental passport crisis, and it's unable to manage its own borders. Imagine, this same government wants to lecture the provinces and Quebec. Are they not at least a little embarrassed? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, investing in housing in Quebec, is the bloc against this? Investing in our daycares is the block against this. Making sure that our young Quebecers go to school with full tummies is the block against this. If that's the case, may they do like the Conservatives. Block Conservatives seem to be on the same side. It's the Block Conservative Party. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. The Prime Minister has the gall to add that if the provinces don't want to bend to his conditions, they don't have to take federal money. Do you know what we call that, Mr. Speaker? We call that blackmail, and not with federal money. There is no federal money. It's Quebecers' money. This government, incapable of doing its own job, has no legitimacy to deny Quebecers their share of the money they pay in taxes. The Prime Minister cannot take the money of Quebecers hostage. He needs to stop playing political games. The Honourable Minister, the bloc is not the government of Quebec. We are just in discussions with the Quebec government. And in fact, the Quebec minister said this week that they are convinced that they can find agreements that will be win-win, Mr. Speaker. That's what the Quebec government thinks, and that's what we think. It's win for Quebec and a win for Quebecers. It's just not a win for the bloc. Once again, they are doing the same thing as their friends, their conservative colleagues, and it's the same thing today. It's the conservative bloc together. The, the honourable member for Burnaby South. How much money the conservatives gave away to big corporations when they were in power? Sixty billion dollars wow. in free money. Now. Imagine what we could have done with $60 billion. Instead of giving them to corporate handouts, we could have built a million affordable homes. Now, the Liberals love to criticize the Conservatives, but they maintain those same corporate handouts. So my question to the Liberals, will they stop the free ride for CEOs? Will they stop the $60 billion in Conservative corporate handouts and start investing to build homes that people can afford, start building a life that people can afford? The Honourable Minister, Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, the Honourable Member, for the question. Fairness is extremely important for Canadians. It is important that we are building a society that is socially just, that is prosperous, and that is environmentally sustainable. Our budget is going to focus on building more homes faster, making more life more affordable for Canadians, and growing an economy for the future. We are very proud of the work that we are doing. We are certainly ensuring that fairness informs everything that we do.
The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. I had nothing to say about the Conservative corporate handouts that they maintained. The last time the Conservatives were in power, big business got a big handout. A blank check for $60 billion, a gift that the Liberals kept up. This money could have been used to build millions of affording, affordable housing units. This is the price of voting Conservative. Will the Prime Minister commit today to reversing the Conservative $60 billion handout to big business, yes or no? Yes. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. It's really important to invest and to build a lot of houses quicker and more affordably. It's necessary to ensure that we can solve the housing crisis. We are working at the same time to help grow the economy as we put money on the table, as we announced this week, to create an acquisition fund for nonprofits who are going to maintain affordability permanently. That's on top of the affordable housing fund, which is investing billions of dollars put a, to put a roof over the head of the most vulnerable. Mr. Speaker, we will do what it takes to make sure everyone in this country has a safe and affordable place to call home. The Honourable Member for Calgary Forest Lawn. Last week, this woke Prime Minister hiked his carbon tax scam 23%, despite a majority of Canadians making him spike the hike. As we see record smashing food bank usage across the country, farmers will pay another billion dollars into this scam, making the cost of groceries even more expensive. After eight years, this Liberal NDP government is not worth the cost or corruption. Will he finally axe the tax for farmers and food and pass Bill C 234 in its original form in next week's budget? Or is his agenda to push even more? families into the food banks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Honourable Minister of Employment and Workforce Development. Mr. Speaker, I would like to know if um, members of the Conservative Party who come from Alberta have paid particular attention to what Premier Danielle Smith said about the Canada carbon rebate when she said she manages the finances of her own house and it turns out that the Canada carbon rebate gives her family more money than she puts in the price on pollution. And guess what? She lives in rural Alberta, so she gets even more, Mr. Speaker. That's the plan. I don't know what the heck they're talking about. Calgary Forest Lawn. What we'd like to know is what his next job is because after the next election, maybe this carbon tax scam will be gone. Now there are six premiers that are demanding a carbon tax meeting because they all know after eight years this will be NDP government or like this carbon tax scam and not worth the cost. Why is this Prime Minister hiding? Why doesn't he show some guts, call this meeting so the premiers can tell him to shove his carbon tax where his poll numbers are in the gutter? I know, I know we've been away for a couple weeks and we're, we're looking forward to seeing each other, but try to keep our comments as, as reasonable as possible. Uh, the Honourable Minister of Employment and Workforce Development. Mr. Speaker, it's nice to see how focused that particular MP is on me and my career. Guess what? My colleagues on this side of the aisle and me, we are focused on the people at Edmonton Centre. We're focused on Albertans. We're focused on Canadians, making sure they can pay their bills, making sure they have good jobs, making sure that we're fighting climate change, having a national school program. What they're doing is just bluff and bluster and lots of hot air. We're going to be here fighting for Canadians each and every day. It's great seeing all of you guys too. This is awesome. The Honourable Member for Haldeman Norfolk. After eight years of this Liberal NDP government, cost of living is out of control. Farmers are suffering and food has become unaffordable because of the carbon tax. Almost two million Canadians are going to the food bank every single month. Yet on April 1st, the Liberal NDP government increased the carbon tax by 23%. Will this Prime Minister stop punishing Canadians and farmers and pass Bill 234? in its original form. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I do think that it's time that the Conservative Party stop trying to mislead Canadians. The price on pollution is an effective mechanism for reducing carbon emissions, and 8 out of 10 Canadian families get more money back, a fact that was underlined by 200 economists across this country that said it is the most efficient and most effective way to reduce emissions that ensures we address affordability. And in fact, Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe last week said he explored alternatives the carbon price, but he found they were too expensive. Well, my goodness, we've been saying that for years. The Honourable Member for Haldeman Norfolk. Canadians can't afford 
afford to live because of the carbon tax. Right. Common sense conservatives will ask the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, That's and right. stop the crime. Right. After eight years of this Liberal NDP government, rent and mortgages have doubled. The Liberal NDP government is just not worth the cost or the corruption. Right. Right. Will this Prime Minister commit to immediately passing Bill 234 in its original form, cancel the carbon tax, and once again make life affordable for Canadians? Yeah. Yeah. General Minister of Natural Resources. This is the fundamental problem with this remade Conservative Party, where policy is based on ideology and ignores all of the facts. 200 economists from across this country underline that the price on pollution enhances affordability for those on modest incomes and addresses climate change in an effective manner. Even Scott Lowe and Daniel Smith have said that. And these folks sit on their hands, these climate-denying Conservatives. It is time they listen to people who actually know what they're talking about and they should abandon their plan to simply let the plan the Honourable Member for Charlebourg, au Saint-Charles. Mr. Speaker, I was in Trois-Rivières last week where the housing vacancy rate is 0.4 per cent. Yet a new CMHC report shows that construction will drop drastically over the next year. Uh, as a result, CMHC predicts that demand will drive up housing prices, but it doesn't make sense. Does the Prime Minister realize that people will end up in the streets because of his insane policies? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My colleague is right to raise the issue of costs and affordability of housing, particularly in Quebec. And that's why it's so surprising that the Conservatives are against investment that we're making for affordable housing, including social housing in Quebec. First, they perhaps noticed a few weeks ago, we announced that we will be reaching objectives for affordable housing construction. And secondly, they still haven't apologized, to the best of my knowledge, for the accusations, they, the insults they made in, uh, with respect to Quebec members of Parliament, including those locally. The Honourable Member for Chabrol saint jean Mr. Speaker, what we saw over the past week are only photo ops because current programs that are being announced as new have been in place since 2017. And since then, nothing has almost been done with these programs. So once again, photo ops, uh, they don't work. What we're seeing now is that for eight years now, there's been out-of-control spending. Will the Prime Minister finally listen to the head of the Bank of Canada and stop his uncontrolled, uncontrolled spending that do nothing but drive up uh, interest rates? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, if my colleague is looking for photo ops, I would ask him to come with me to visit a project in his riding, the Monte Rosso. We haven't seen him for the past few weeks since project was announced. Ms. Marchand was there a few weeks ago, and they seem to have forget in his own riding, hundreds of housing units were built, rather than the only mere six units that his uh, leader built when they were in power. The Honourable Member for Longo saint hubert Mr. Speaker, if Ottawa wanted to accelerate housing construction in Quebec, they would pay Quebec the housing mo money. We're ready. We have our own standing programs. We're the only ones in Canada. Simply announcing uh, uh, unconditional transfers would suffice. But no, the Liberals are threatening to de deprive Quebec of this funding if it refuses their conditions. And we're announcing a dispute with the federal government until 2025. We have a housing crisis. People want funding, not bickering. Why not just pay Quebec its share without strings so we can do the work now, not in 2025? The Honourable Minister of Infrastructure and Housing, Mr. Speaker, like my well, my colleague is looking for disputes. We're looking for a solution. Yes, there's a Houser, housing accelerator fund. There are discussions underway. We have reached an agreement for several billions to af build affordable housing for all provinces. So we're going to continue to make the necessary investment to address future housing in Quebec and across the country. The Honourable Member for Langueuil saint hubert it's not just a Quebec question of jurisdiction, because when the government gets involved, it takes longer. It's, what, it's true. Quebecers want the government to work together. 
but the federal government is not doing it. The Liberals have said it themselves. They want to sp uh, squabble until January 2025 to impose their conditions. Who does this help today? Who does it help to know that there'll be no construction starts in 2025 because the federal government is not working as a team? The Honourable Minister of Transportation, Mr. Speaker, my colleague is talking about squabbles, but they are that undisputed champions of these squabbles. They seem to take inspiration from them. That's their whole lives. It's the raison d'etre to bring these to Ottawa. And as I've said, Mr. Speaker, we're investing in housing, unlike the Conservatives, and they are going to vote with the Conservatives, though. We don't want children to go to school hungry, but they're going to vote against that. That's the new Bloc Conservative Alliance. The Honourable Member for Longueuil saint Mr. Speaker, we are lacking 5.8 million units by 2030, and the Liberals still find time to squabble instead of taking action. If their priority was to accelerate housing, they would give the money to Quebec. Are they trying to accelerate housing or slow their slide in the polls? The new Liberal housing announcements are taking hostage Quebecers who are struggling to find housing with their own money for electoral purposes. In the midst of a housing crisis, is this putting priorities in the right place? The Honourable Minister of Transportation, Mr. Speaker, once again, we are in discussions with the government of the Quebec, but the Bloc is not speaking on behalf of the Quebec government. Actually, they are campaigning against the current government, against the Parti Québécois. And in the meantime, we are reaching agreements with Quebec on housing, on daycare, on regional internet access on many measures, Mr. Speaker. Why? Because it's good for all Quebecers. And when it's good for Quebecers, it's bad for the Bloc Québécois. The Honourable Member for Kelowna Lake Country. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, it's shocking that the average Canadian family must now spend 63.5% of their total pre-tax household income in order to afford a mortgage for the typical home in Canada. Now, it's even way worse in British Columbia, where that's 106%. 100% is someone's entire income. No wonder families are in a financial crisis where they can barely afford to live or feed themselves. And this is after eight years of this NDP Liberal government. Will the Prime Minister actually build the homes, not bureaucracy and photo ops, in his budget? The Honourable Minister of Infrastructure and Housing. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I take the question with a heavy dose of irony, considering that we've invested $31.5 million through the Housing Accelerator Fund in that member's constituency. Moreover, Mr. Speaker, this is a fund that not only she, but every Conservative member of Parliament vows to d take apart should they form government. Where they will cut funds for housing, we will make the investment. Where we cut taxes, they will put them back on. We are doing what it takes to make it easier to build homes faster, and we're going to put the Canadians to work in the process. Well, member for Kelowna Lake Country. Well, Mr. Speaker, a heavy dose of reality is after eight, year, eight years of this Liberal NDP government and all of their spending in photo ops, things are worse. And just today, RBC confirmed that Canada's housing crisis is only going to get worse under Liberal policies. They said only 26% of Canadian households can afford a single detached home today. Now, a couple decades ago, that was 49%. The CMHC forecast in 2025-26 housing starts will even be lower than in 2020-2021. So this Prime Minister is just not worth the cost and the corruption. Will the Prime Minister actually build the homes, not bureaucracy and photo ops, in his budget? Honourable yeah. Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we are going to put forward policies that are going to help solve the national housing crisis. We know that higher interest rate environments have made it difficult to build homes. That's why we are cutting taxes on new home construction, which they oppose. It's why we're putting more money on the table to build new apartments, which they oppose. It's why we put money towards incentivizing changes for cities, which they oppose. And just this past week, their deputy leader held a press conference to proudly declare that they were siding with the NIMBYs when it came to municipal zoning reforms. We need to do everything we can to make it easier to build homes more quickly and more cost effectively. It's a shame the Conservatives oppose at every stage. The Honourable Member for Shukutimi Lefjord, Mr. Speaker, after eight years of deficit spending, people are no longer able to find affordable housing. There's still more bureaucracy than common sense solutions. This Prime Minister is not worth the cost. In Saguenay, in just 24 hours, a landlord received over 200 requests for his apartment and apartments are becoming increasingly rare and expensive. Mr. Speaker, 
in his next budget will this Prime Minister finally build housing and stop adding red tape? The Honourable Minister of Public Services. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next budget is coming up, and we already know there will be other measures for housing. And my colleague also needs to know that only two months ago, we signed with the Quebec government a, an agreement for $1.8 billion. And this will provide the largest number of new housing units in the history of Quebec. This is an exceptional event that stems from uh, extraordinary collaboration. Unlike the Conservatives who are just squabbling and insulting people, uh, the provinces and the municipalities in particular, we are working for Co Quebecers with hundreds of thousands of units for the coming years. In Griesbach. Mr. Speaker, Shaw Zeb is a young dad in Toronto. He feels stuck. He can't afford to leave his parents' home and, like many Canadians, is feeling hopeless. 85,000 people in Toronto alone are waiting for social housing. And it's because 30 years of Liberals ignoring the problem while the gut-and-cut Conservatives lost over 800,000 affordable homes. Are the Liberals going to keep throwing money at rich developers for luxury condos, or will they start to build social and affordable housing Canadians desperately need? Here, here, here. The Honourable Minister of Infrastructure and Housing. Mr. Speaker, let me begin by congratulating my uh, friend and colleague on his recent appointment. I look forward to working with him to defend housing okay. for the most vulnerable in the months ahead. With respect, Mr. Speaker, we have put investments on the table that are building affordable housing for low-income families over the past number of years, and we are accelerating that work. The upcoming federal budget is going to include $1.5 billion to help nonprofits acquire social housing so it can be kept affordable forever. We have made in the fall economic statement an additional billion-dollar investment to build more affordable housing stock and we're working with provinces and territories by putting federal money on the table and using federal leadership to help solve the housing crisis, including for the most vulnerable. I'm looking forward to continuing this work alongside my colleague. The Honourable Member for Nunavut. Grocery prices in the north are still sky high. In the latest fire from North Mar in Iqaluit, a jar of pasta sauce is over $10. When I asked the Minister of Northern Affairs about the Broken Nutrition North program, he pointed pointed to internal reviews and studies. Indigenous peoples and Northerners do not need more studies. They need to put food on the table. When will the Liberals stop the delays and fix Nutrition North so people can put groceries on the table? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Northern Affairs. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my colleague for her question. We know that affordability is an issue for all Canadian families, and we know that it is even a larger issue across the North. That's why in our time in government, we have doubled our investment in programs like Nutrition North. We've added to programs like the Harvester's Investment Program to allow people to have affordable foods that come from the land. We'll continue to work with the territories and all communities to support them in, in achieving affordable food and nutritious food for their communities. The Honourable Member for Scarborough Agent Court. Mr. Speaker, no child should go to school hungry, but we know that for many families that is the reality. For parents of young children, a national school food program would help them feed their children and reduce their food costs. By providing consistent access to nutritious meals, we can set kids up for success. Can the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development update this House on the progress of building a national food program? The Honourable Member for Fam uh, the Honourable Minister of Families, Children and Social Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I know my colleagues and fellow moms and dads on this side of the House agree that no child should go to school hungry. And that's why we announced just last week a $1 billion investment mm -hmm. through Budget yeah. 2024 for a national school food program. This program will ensure that children who arrive at school hungry have access to food, ensuring additional 400,000 kids will be able to access this food. We will work with the provinces and territories and Indigenous partners to roll this out. We know that Conservatives have voted against this, but we're doing the hard work. The Honourable Member for Elgin, Middlesex, London. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this NDP Liberal government, Canadians cannot achieve their goal of owning a home and continue to struggle amidst this crisis. According to a recent report in the Globe and Mail, Canada needs to complete 320,000 housing units annually from now until 2030 to meet the demand. Canadians have had enough and must see this crisis managed properly. This Prime Minister is not worth the cost nor the corruption. Will the Prime Minister stop basing this budget on bureaucracy and photo ops and actually build the homes? The Honourable Minister of Families. Mr. Speaker, uh, quite the contrary. You know, I have the opportunity to speak with many mums and dads across this country about the programs that we've been putting in place to support them. I recently spoke to Chris, who lives in Peterborough. She's a Trent University student. She shared the impact of our waiving of the interest on student loans. She shared the impact of being able to access $10 a day childcare as well as the Canada Child Benefit. These programs have saved her tremendously and helped her and her daughter get ahead. Member for Elgin, Middlesex, London. But Canadians need a home, and Canada has not built any more ho fewer homes than we did in back in the 1970s, where our population was half of what it is today. We need 320,000 units being built between 20 before 2030. This requires a record pace of construction, which will already exhaust an already burnt-out workforce. Canadians need solutions. This Prime Minister is not worth the cost. Will this Prime Minister stop making announcements and just get the houses built? The Honourable Minister of Housing. Stanley. What helps mums and dads across this country afford a home, Mr. Speaker? Being able to have access to $10 a day childcare and get back into the workforce. We're seeing record numbers of women, of moms, get back into the workforce, giving them the opportunity to contribute to their family finances and be able to afford a safe place to live. Contrast that to the Conservatives' continued fear-mongling. On this side of the House, we're doing the hard work to support families. That's right. The Honourable Member for Bacon Ciclerable. After eight years of this Liberal government, finding housing in Canada is a nightmare. It's, it's ironic to see the ministers and prime ministers travelling the country boasting how uh, incompetent they've been in terms of housing. And the proof is that the CMHC, CMHC reminded them last year that uh, average home prices doubled last year, and that is under the Liberals. Will next week's budget finally be used to build homes, or is it going to increase red tape? The, the Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Obviously, next week's budget is going to contribute to even more housing, but let's uh, think about the numbers. Six and eight thousand. The Conservative leader across the country created six affordable housing units, but in the past week, we've signed an agreement with Quebec for, to, to build 8,000 housing units just for Quebec. So, unfortunately, my Conservative colleague, colleagues in Quebec have, uh, are not supporting the Liberals. So, uh, hopefully, they'll be able to contact us. President. Mr. Speaker, what the minister needs to know is that, with, that when the member of Carleton was a minister, all housing was affordable in Canada, Mr. Speaker. Now the Liberals have doubled home prices for all Canadians. Young people would think that they'll never be home, homeowners. Seniors can no longer pay their rents. They have to stay in substandard housing, Mr. Speaker. Eighty percent of people are going to have to renew their mortgages, but they're worried they won't be able to make their payments. Mr. Speaker, once again, will the Liberals finally use common sense next week by announcing that they're going to build housing and not just create more red tape? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My colleague is right. All affordable housing built uh, by uh, all, all six units of affordable housing were affordable. But uh, we're going to create, uh, build hundreds of thousands of affordable housing units under the agreements we've signed. Just in Quebec, we're talking about 8,000 social housing units that are planned for next month. That's a historic agreement. And uh, we signed it with the Quebec government. The Honourable Member for Jonquière. 
while the federal government encroaches on Quebec's areas, ju areas of jurisdiction, it, it should look at its own areas of jurisdiction. The Prime Minister has finally admitted that immigration levels have exceeded our integration capacity. But who's the irresponsible person who increased permanent immigration without thinking of houses, schools, or health care? Who is this reckless individual who called people xenophobic when we talked about integration capacity? Mr. Speaker, if only we knew who this person was, could could be even the same person who's racking up debt. Does the Prime Minister know the name of this irresponsible individual? Honorable Minister. The Honorable Minister. What the member across the way doesn't want to recognize is that we have an excellent uh, relationship with the Quebec government. I visited with the minister to see where we can work together. We agree to that we want to partner to ensure that uh, temporary uh, people here who have the, ser have the services they need. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Jean-Pierre. Since the uh, Prime Minister is responsible for the largest population increase since 1957, many people think are blaming him for the housing crisis. Sure, he lit the fire, but is he trying to put it out? Did he lower immigration targets? No. Did he lighten Quebec's loads in terms of asylum seekers by sending them elsewhere? No. Has he reduced temporary immigration? No, he wants to hike it to 2 million. That is the highest level since last year, but the highest in history. Now that he sees that there's an integra integration capacity problem, is he going to fix it? The Honourable Minister of Immigration. The Bloc Québécois sh should uh, watch the news because we said that we were going to reduce uh, the level of uh, immigration from 7% to 5%. So where would they think, uh, where do they think that we should cut then? And they should need to be specific because they all have temporary workers in their ridings. So they need to be clear on what they want. Presenter. Mr. Speaker, Canadians are clear on the two most important economic issues we face, inflation and high interest rates. And they understand that government de deficits cause inflation. Runaway deficits cause runaway inflation. This year's deficit is expected to be $47 billion, $7 billion higher than forecast. To say this is a runaway is an understatement. The Bank of Canada the governor has been clear deficits are the main factor keeping interest rates high. Will the Prime Minister cap his runaway spending with a dollar-for-dollar dollar rule to bring down interest rates and inflation? Here, here, here. The Honourable Minister of Natural Resources. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is important that a responsible government addresses issues around affordability. It addresses issues around environmental sustainability. It invests in growing a clean economy, and it, and it, it has a sound fiscal management strategy. We are doing all of those things. On the other side of this house, we have a Conservative Party of Canada who simply wants to cut and to cut and to cut. They will cut affordable child care. They will cut dental care. They will cut the national school for program. They will cut the entire climate program. They will actually cut investments in growing a clean economy for the future. My goodness, it's such an irresponsible position that these folks are taking. The Honourable Member for Calgary Centre. Mr. Speaker, this government is just throwing taxpayer money at a wall without any thought about execution, and it's making matters worse for Canadians. It's a whack-a-mole approach to economic policy. Obviously, after eight years of this NDP Liberal government, Canadians can't afford this Prime Minister his excess spending, nor his corruption. Scotiabank says that rate cuts could be delayed by high government spending. Wow. Next week, the Minister of Finance will table her budget. It is time for the deficits to stop. Will the Minister commit to a dollar-for-dollar dollar reduction in order to bring inflation and interest rates under control? Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Minister of Natural Revenue. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we will always be there to support Canadians, especially vulnerable Canadians. 
while maintaining a prudent fiscal position, including a AAA credit rating, Mr. Speaker, and the lowest debt to GDP ratio in the G7. We've been there for seniors with increases in the GIS and the OAS. We are there for school children with a national school food program. We are there for millennials and Gen Z with affordable housing and rental accommodation. Mr. Speaker, on this side of the House, we know how to do prudence as well as providing for the most vulnerable in this country. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Charleswood, St. James, Assiniboia, Headingley. You know what's keeping interest rates so high, Mr. Speaker? Liberal deficit spending. That's what. Yes. Now we can add Scotiabank to the long list of economists saying after eight years, this NDP Liberal government is not worth the cost. Record high deficits are keeping housing, food and fuel at record high prices. Will the Prime Minister fix the budget and adopt our common sense conservative policy by bringing in a dollar for dollar rule to bring down inflation and interest rates? Here, here. The Honourable Minister of the Treasury Board. Mr. Speaker, unlike the party opposite, we actually know the role of the Independent Bank of Canada, which is to set monetary policy. While we are prudently managing taxpayer dollars, we will continue to invest in Canadians. Because of our policies, 86% of women between the ages of 25 and 45 are in the workforce. That's the Canada Child Benefit, and that's $10 a day childcare. Every single time the party opposite has an opportunity to support Canadians, they vote against, Mr. Speaker. That's right. not common sense at all. The Honourable Member for Richmond Centre. Mr. Speaker, young Canadians in my community of Richmond and across Canada are struggling to find housing that fits their budget. We're scaling up our efforts to build more homes and build them faster at prices Canadians can afford. Through the Housing Accelerator Fund, our federal government is investing over $35 million in the city of Richmond to fast-track the construction of 1,000 homes over the next three years and 3,100 homes over the next decade. Can the minister share with my community of Richmond and communities across British Columbia on how our government is supporting housing in Budget 2024? The Honourable Minister of Infrastructure and Housing. Mr. Speaker, let me thank my honourable colleague for his advocacy for his community that's going to help get thousands of homes built in Richmond over the course of the next number of years. In the upcoming federal budget, we're going to continue to put measures on the table that help accelerate the pace of home building. This includes low-cost financing to add tens of thousands of new rental units. This includes additional support to help nonprofits acquire housing that they will keep affordable forever. It includes no investments in affordable housing and new strategies to build homes more quickly by incentivizing home building in factories. With members like this advocating for their community, we can put a plan on the table that will solve the national housing crisis. The Honourable Member for Durham. Mr. Speaker, Durham region is home to many millennials who dream of owning a house one day. For eight years, this Prime Minister has been promising affordable housing, and yet things are only getting worse. Millennials know this Prime Minister is not worth the cost. The Liberal NDP government continues to announce expensive photo ops in the lead-up to the federal budget. But we know, as millennials, that we deserve better. That's right. How can we ever believe any of these broken promises from the Liberal NDP government again? The Honourable Minister of Infrastructure and Housing. Mr. Speaker, let me begin by offering my sincere congratulations to our newest colleague in the House of Commons. It's wonderful to have you here. What he may not realize, Mr. Speaker, being new to the House, is that his leader is actively campaigning on commitments to build fewer homes than we are already projected to build. He may not realize that the Conservative leader has promised to raise taxes on home building. He may not realize the Conservative leader has pledged to cut funding for home building. And he may not realize that his party held a press conference last week to say that they don't want to do anything on 
municipal reforms and have decided to side with the NIMBYs. Mr. Speaker, over his time here, I hope he comes to see the light and gets with a plan that will build more homes. Here, here. The Honourable Member for Kamloops, Thompson Caribou. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this Liberal Prime Minister's radical safe supply agenda, we see lives being put at risk. After this NDP Liberal government decriminalized hard drugs, nurses now in northern British Columbia are being told to allow patients to use hard drugs in their rooms and have hot weapons in their hospital rooms. This, Mr. Speaker, is unfair and unsafe for workers and patients. Mr. Speaker, when will this Prime Minister wake up and realize that his radical drug policy just isn't worth the cost? Yeah. Honourable Minister of Mental Health and Addiction. Mr. Speaker, every health care worker in this country deserves to be safe in their place of work. That's why this government passed legislation exactly for that reason. I too am concerned about the reports and expect the BC government to take the necessary actions to address the concerns raised by health care providers. On this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, we're saving lives. On that side of the House, they're busy with slogans and stigma. The Honourable Member for Cumberland Colchester. Mr. Speaker, 300 per cent more government issued opioids are being seized by police in British Columbia. More drugs on the street mean the street prices for opioids are falling across this country, and that's what we're seeing. This delusional NDP Liberal government wants you to think that giving out free drugs to our most vulnerable is a cure. But Canadians know this is nonsense. When will this narcissistic Prime Minister, who is not worth the cost, crime or corruption, end this cruel and disastrous... to be judicious in uh, in there in there I will let the honorable member maybe rephrase that the honorable member for Cumberland Colchester well, uh, you know what Mr. Speaker what I would like to say here is given the fact that I uh, practice a physician a long time that's the diagnosis Mr. Speaker Listen. We'll have a quick chat after question period. The Honourable Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Mr. Speaker, while the Conservatives want to sow fear and stigma, on this side of the House, we know that we have to stick to the facts. The RCMP says there is no evidence to suggest widespread diversion of drugs from prescribed alternatives is happening. However, prescribed alternatives are not the issue, Mr. Speaker. Any diversion is illegal in this country, whether it's medication for ADHD, pain management, or anything else. Those are the facts, Mr. Speaker. 70% of the overdose deaths are from an illegal toxic poison supply, and I challenge the member to actually read the data. The Honourable Member for Egmont. Mr. Speaker, the fishery is the backbone of Canada's coastal communities, and Liberal members of Parliament will always be there to stand up for fishers, their families, and our fishing communities. On February the 8th, the House of Commons Standing Committee on Fisheries and Oceans adopted a motion proposed by Liberal members of Parliament to launch the official five-year review of the Fishery Act. Can the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans explain the significance of the Fisheries Act review for, post, for coastal communities to this House? Good question. Good question. The Honourable Minister. To congratulate the Liberal members of the Standing Committees of Fisheries and Ocean for moving forward with this important review. Coastal communities know that the Fisheries Act does more than just regulate fishing, but is also a key law that impacts local economies, ecological protections, and reconciliation. This review is just the first step toward a Fisheries Act that work better for communities on all coasts. I look forward to seeing the committee's recommendation at the end of this study. The Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. This government promised to ban the AR-15. That's the weapon that was used to murder 26-year-old children at Sandy Hook. And yet on Thursday, the Conservative leader was tweeting that the government wasn't going after the AR-15, but hunting rifles. So little wonder he gets endorsed by Alex Jones, who's notorious for taunting 
child, families of children murdered by the AR-15. So will the minister confirm, is the government going after hunting rifles or the AR-15, or is this the Conservative leader being the, quote, real deal of disinformation for the likes of Alex Jones? The Honourable Minister of Public Service, our public safety. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my colleague for his question and salute his long service in this House on behalf of the people of Lake Ontario. Mr. Speaker, uh, I share... The Honourable Minister of Public Safety. Applause, Mr. Speaker, in the House before. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I share our colleagues' concern about the Conservative policy with respect to gun control. We have said from the beginning law abiding hunters and sports persons are not the subject of these regulations. Mr. Speaker, what we're doing is taking away guns that were designed to kill people on the battlefield, and we're also prepared to compensate the people that bought those guns lawfully. It's something the Conservative Party will undo, and we're committed to keeping Canadians safe. The Honourable Member for Richemont, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, since I've been a member here, every February we receive the list of projects that were accept accepted or refused under New Horizons, a program that improves the lives of seniors. Unfortunately, this year, for a reason we weren't told, we haven't had access to this information, so we can't help our local organizations. I've sent three emails, made five phone calls, and even sent a fax to the Office of the Minister of Labour and uh, seniors, but I didn't even receive an acknowledgement of receipt. Mr. Speaker, it's very discouraging. In order to do our work properly, we would like the Minister to explain why we're not getting this information and will the situation be rectified? Thank you. Honourable Minister. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Honourable Member for the question, and even a fax, uh, so I've uh, got no excuse there. I will, uh, I will dig in deeper and uh, get the answers that the Member is looking for. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Great idea. And that's all the time we have for question period today. Uh,